Hey guys, welcome back to Grace and Truth Fellowship. We're going to be looking at the issue of giving, and I want to look at some some areas of confusion because as Christians, we want to know exactly what God wants us to do. How does He want us to give in the body of Christ? And uh, there's a lot, lot of uh, false teachings going around that we're going to address, and some things that I think will really unleash God's power in your life if you realize the role that God wants us to have as people giving to those around us. And I'm not just talking about financially, I'm talking about spiritually giving things to people as well. Uh, and the first thing I think that, you know, really need to start with is how to give. And that is, you know, something that the Bible is very clear on. It says if, if we're going to give, we should give in love. And here Paul says, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast. But do not have love, I gain nothing. So here, no, it doesn't, it's not a matter of how much, it's a matter of are we giving in love? And we're supposed to give from the heart. He says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. If you're giving and you're cheerful about it, it's obviously coming from your heart and it's something that you are spiritually okay with. It's out of the excess of this love that God, this abundance of love that's in your heart that God's given you that you're able to give cheerfully. It's not just something that's natural to us. Naturally, we want to hang on to everything and, and claim, you know, this is mine and we want to take possession of things, but God's Spirit does just the opposite and it gives us this ability to give cheerfully. He says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will, will reward you. So when you're giving, don't do it in a way that other people are going to know about it. Let your giving be between you and God. And if there's a way to give to somebody without even them knowing where it came from, I think that's always a better way to not not give something for the sake of anyone knowing but you and God. Because your reward is with God. And when you look at what the New Testament churches, those New Testament, I don't like the word churches here, but the Christians in the New Testament, these believers, what they were doing and how they were giving, it's a very powerful example. And it says here that all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now it doesn't say they sold all, and I think a lot of people will see that and are like, oh, they sold everything. Well, they sold property and possessions. So these people who had things that they could get rid of, that they could use to help out, they were selling things to provide for those around them. They were so fired up with God's Spirit that things were no longer important to them. If it wasn't a necessity, they were selling these things and giving to people who had need. And that's an important word, need. It wasn't, oh, they just give everybody what they want. If somebody had a, a serious need, they wanted to help those people out. Okay, And that is something God put on their hearts through this spirit that was being poured out in the, you know, you look in the book of Acts, God's spirit was being poured out on these people. Just like it is on us today. He said, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And this is a prophecy here being quoted. It says, as it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. So what these people were doing when they were selling this property that they had, and they were given to, to anyone who had need, this was a prophecy. God knew that His Spirit would bring this out in people, that they would have this willingness to give, and they would have this, you know, this lack of concern for stuff, and, you know, and, and all their possessions, and we kind of get consumed with what we have and what we want, and, and so many things become needs that aren't really needs to us. But these people were freely giving their gifts to the poor to help out those who were in need. In every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So these people were graciously meeting together. They were excited and they weren't just 
doing something as a, oh, let's just meet on Wednesdays, or let's just meet on Sundays, or let's just do, you know, our small group. Now, these guys, these people were meeting together every single day, and they were gladly meeting together. It wasn't like they were doing this ritualistically. They were excited about God and the outpouring of the Spirit and the spreading of the gospel. You know, here this Messiah that they that so many of them had seen and they'd been healed by, and they knew he had been risen from the dead. And they knew that, you know, God was pouring out his Spirit on them, and they were meeting together every day, and they were gladly giving whatever needed to be given to help out others. And I think that's what was so powerful in their spreading of the gospel so early on, why Christianity survived despite great persecution was their excitement and their genuine love and their sacrificing for others. And it says, all the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And I don't know about you, but I don't remember going to church on Sunday and hearing that we should be like this. You know, there's always... You know, I hear so many stories of people going to church to hear the message, to hear the gospel. And it's a lot of times it's people who don't even know God. And yeah, you know, and they'll say, I tried church. All they did was talk about money. And I think that's a real shame because the power of God has nothing to do with giving to get money. It has nothing to do with worldly possessions. And I think there's been some confusion about this. And it's very popular to try to equate God with this God of money who gives you what you deserve and you know you give and you're gonna get but when you look at the biblical perspective of God and how he relates to you specifically and, and what he wants for you it has very little to do with being rich <laughs> you know that being rich biblically was it's not always seen as a as a good thing necessarily it's not a sign of of godliness you know these people being rich I mean look at Jesus he was a person walking the earth who said he didn't even have a place to lay his head. He didn't have a home. He didn't have all these worldly possessions. If godliness made you rich, Jesus would have been, you know, the richest person to have ever walked the earth. What What's important is our reward that we receive. You know, the Bible talks about our reward in heaven or in, in the resurrection. We're going to have a reward for the things that we do on this earth. And here in Revelations, we hear the Lord say, Behold, I am coming soon bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. And we see this over and over again. He says, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? So here we're see, we see that poor in the eyes of the world is actually a good thing in the eyes of God and his kingdom. Because these people are going to be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom that God promised. So I think there's something to that, to this message here of, of godliness and, and what it actually equates to. He says, and if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Well, what's this reward that keeps being talked about? <laughs> and and when I read that, I, I re, it reminds me of the Proverbs where he says, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. And this is in Proverbs. And when you read, when you listen to the parables, like what you know, what Jesus spoke, he's, he's given a parable here. He says, The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And this was a parable of Jesus referring to a king. And, you know, he's, he's, he's speaking of himself here in this parable. He's going to come back. And when he does, the things that you did for the least of these brothers and sisters, you did for him. Can you imagine how excited you better be about giving and helping your brothers and sisters when Jesus Christ comes back with his reward? What are you going to have to show? You know, he's going to say, you know, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was, sick, you know, and all these things. When he was, when you read that parable that he talks about, because they're going to ask, where did, where did we see you? Where did we, when did we not give to you? And and you look at the New Testament church, they're giving everything, they're sharing everything. So when the Lord comes back, their reward is going to be great. And I think we should all strive to be those kind of people who are understanding that when we give to the poor, or when we give to the believers. He said, we're lending to the Lord. I think that's a powerful understanding to come to and the importance of giving 
Because who are you giving to when you give out of love? Who Who is our reward with? Is it because we're going to get some money back and, and pay off bills and have a nice car and have nice things? No. It's because our reward is going to be great in God's kingdom. And there are people in this world that are rich already. You know, they have millions of dollars and or, or maybe they are... They start out poor and they become a Christian and, and still they somehow financially prosper. The Bible doesn't say that you can't be that kind of a person. It just says do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth <laughs> where the moss and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where the moss and the vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there your heart will be also. So wherever you your treasure is in this lifetime, is it with God or is it with the things of this earth? Or is your treasure specifically with what you're going to get financially? If it is, that's where your heart's going to be and, and that's where your reward's going to be. Don't let that be where your reward is. Let your treasure be in God's kingdom. And he says, command those who are rich. And this is a message for people with financial gifts and, and people that are already wealthy he says command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment so if you are wealthy if you are a person who has all this money you know and you've you've prospered financially it can be a good thing if you are if you understand that that is not where you're to put your hope. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. He says, in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So there is no life in this money and all this stuff that we want to acquire. He says. That if they are willing to share, he's not saying that uh, get rid of all your stuff and don't have money, but he's saying be willing to share. Be rich in good deeds and willing to share. In this way, you will lay up treasures for yourselves. And, and that's important that we understand, you know, how does, how does giving apply to us? And I, I want to look at, uh, you know, in a second, some of the, the misconceptions that we hear a lot when we go to church, especially as it relates to tithing and and taking up offerings and things like that. Uh, it says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And that word content, you're going to see it a lot when when you're looking at the New Testament and what they want, what God wants for us to be. He wants us to be thankful, to give thanks in all circumstances, and being content with what we have, whether it's a little or a lot, that is what, you know, that's where our joy is going to be, is just being content and thankful for the things we have. It's not about having all kinds of financial blessings. And I want to look at the tithing dilemma that we all seem to be in because I think there's confusion I know that I've struggled with do I pay my tithes or do I not because I know I'm under grace I'm no longer under the Old Testament law but it seems like everywhere you go every church you visit they tell you that it's a commandment or it's at least something that you should do you know and you look at the little cards in the back of the seats and they'll quote a verse about tithing but if you really look into what tithing was in the Old Testament it's not something that everyone was giving from their income okay it was it says a tithe of everything from the land whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees belongs to the lord it is holy to the lord and this is in the book of leviticus and he says i give to the levites these Le levitical priests to the levites all the tithes in israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of meeting so these levites these these priests that were working in the temple he said that this was for their inheritance Okay, and it wasn't financial. I, I couldn't find a verse that said these people were getting rich off of 10% of everyone's money. They were getting from the land. He said, and we will bring a tithe of our crops to the Levites, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. 
So these Levites, and we keep seeing this, they were to bring into the storehouse the portions required by the law for the priests and the Levites. For Judah was pleased with the ministering priests and the Levites. These people, God was, was asking them to supply this need for this specific group of people and they were under the law at this time we're we're not under the law and in the new testament i think there's a reason why in the book of acts and you go from acts to revelations you, you don't see them saying let's pay 10 percent." jesus isn't talking to his believers about doing this about paying tithes and he says he ordered the people living in jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and the levites so they could devote themselves to the law of the lord these levites were devoted to the law and that's what tithing was about so if we try to apply it to the administration of grace that we're now under you know that you know the law came through Moses and the Bible tells us that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ we're under a different administration and so for us to say that we're gonna do something for God under the law and we're gonna get blessed under this this and, and I think the the biggest place where people kind of see this verse and go you know what this is something we can do you know we can do this and get something in, in tithes and offerings you're under a curse your whole nation because you're robbing me bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house test me in this says the lord almighty and see if i will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings that there will not be enough room to store it and i have heard this verse used used in churches to say that if you pay your tithes at this church then god's going to throw open the floodgates and, and I think this is a misapplication of scripture because this is applying to someone under the law and they're paying things to the Levites. And I don't know about you, but I don't know any Levites around here that I would pay my tithes to and I don't have crops. And I don't have, maybe I can go to the local you know, Walmart and find some, uh, some uh, things from the land to bring in there. But I think it's, I think if you want to give 10% to God, to your church and to your, to your community, that is great. And, and you can use that as a blessing. And if you're giving that cheerfully, there's nothing wrong with that. But understand that this isn't something that God's commanding us in the New Testament to do. We are under this new found freedom to give from the heart and to give as anyone has need and to be as one. And the only thing that I ever saw in Scripture where there was anything taken from an income was what Jesus was, was approached by somebody that was the collector of the two drachma temple tax. And you can actually find this coin. I thought that was interesting that they still have this exact same coin that they were trying to collect here. He says, he came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? And they said, yes, he does. You know, they're, they're surely, you know, he's paying this tax. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. He said, what do you think, Simon? He asked, from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? And Jesus is kind of giving them a parable here. And he says, from their own children or from others. So who are these kings <laughs> collecting taxes from? And these people wanted taxes for their temple. And Peter said, from others. You know, obviously these kings aren't going to tax their own children. And Jesus said, then the children are exempt. He's referring to us, you know, in this parable. <laughs> and Jesus, and uh, Jesus said to him, but so that we may not cause offense. You know, he's, he's saying, look, we're exempt. We're God's children. But you know what? So we don't, we don't cause offense to these people. You know, go cast your line he says take the first fish you catch open its mouth and you will find a four drachma coin take it and give it to them for my tax and for yours i thought i thought it was pretty neat uh, comparison here that jesus was talking about the kings who are they going to tax you know these the children are exempt from the tax but he's like you know what let's don't cause offense let's go let's pay these people their temple tax and and he was doing it simply not to offend them. So even Jesus, when he hears of some tax imposed on people of his time, on their income for the temple, he knew that it didn't apply to him. He was already under that freedom of God. And, and I think that the one time Jesus really seems to just go off and he starts overturning tables and doing things that weren't really in his nature, that, you know, when you look at how peaceful and loving and everything he was, there's something that really upset him it was when his father's house was turned into a house of money. It says in the temple courts he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them, uh, all from the uh, temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. So he was he was extremely upset by what he saw. He says to those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. 
his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So Jesus was really, really upset because people were turning his father's house into a marketplace, into a store, into a place of selling something to make money. What are we doing in our churches today? You have these, and people, you know, talk about this a lot, these mega preachers, your Joel Osteens and your, you know, Billy Graham and all these preachers who have these thousands of people following them. And they are living in mansions that could house hundreds of thousands of people. They have all this property, all this wealth. And are they eager to share? And I think that's the judgment you have from people outside the church going, well, geez, if you're the highest, you know, the, you're, highest paid preacher isn't sharing his money you know he's not housing all the poor he's not doing he's definitely living the high life uh, what example is that what example are we if that's how we use our wealth and, and, and what are we doing if we say you know everyone give to this ministry give to me you know so I can preach but don't just meet my needs I need more I need more and I got you know all this stuff that is not what God intended for us and I think it's a it's something one of those kind of common sense things when you see it you just kind of know that that is not right and that's not what God intends for us to be as as believers to be these wealthy you know beyond rich people now Paul does talk about giving to a ministry and he was here he was de devoting his life obviously the last years of his life he devoted to the gospel and he said it was good for you to share in my troubles and he's talking to these people he's saying yeah that uh, you know when I sent out, when I was sent out from uh, Macedonia, not one church shared with me. Not you know the believers they didn't share with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. Okay, and he's talking about giving and receiving. And he says, not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. All right. So Paul understands that when these people are giving to him to help him out, and he says that they have already helped him out. You know that they were the only ones who helped him out. He says. But he wants more to be accredited to their account because he knows he's a man of God and when they are helping him they are adding to their reward in heaven okay and he tells them that this is a you know they are a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God he says and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus not according to the riches of this world but according to the riches of God's glory in Christ Jesus that's powerful and now the false teachings that I want to warn you about and you've probably seen them you've probably seen books on the shelves you know in the Christian bookstores that talk about God's money plan for you and how God's gonna financially open the floodgates and do all these great things for you but when you look at the stern warning we find in Scripture he says these are the things you are to teach and insist on if anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching they are conceited and understand nothing he says they have an unhealthy interest in controversies quarrels about words that result in envy strife malicious talk evil suspicion and constant friction between people of corrupt mind he says who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain uh, does that sound familiar or what he said that these people have been robbed of the truth and what is it that they think? They think that godliness is how they're going to make a living. Is is this godliness is going to be this, you know, quick road to financial success? And that is somebody. If somebody has been robbed of the truth, and that's what they're teaching, don't think that a man of God filled with the Spirit is going to teach you that kind of a thing. That's not what godliness is about. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And that's that word that we talked about. You're going to see it a lot when when you're here. What God wants for us it's not that we're rich in this lifetime it's that we're content it says for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it but if we have food and clothing we will be content with that so those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap <laughs> and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Now, how many times have you heard stories of these people who lose their jobs? This their great source of income. They have a family and they end up committing suicide or they just go into drugs. I mean, it's like, oh, the financial ruin is just the worst thing that could ever happen. And this is what God's warning us about. He says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. 
Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. It has led people away from the faith. He says, and they've pierced themselves with many griefs. And God doesn't want us to live that way. It, what good is it if you're going to work so hard and you're going to fight so hard to get all this money and all this wealth and to have these big things that you want, but you're not content with it anyway. And you're not, where's your joy? Where's your love? Where's your peace? Where is your gift when the Lord returns? You know, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Paul tells us when we talk about being content, I love this here. He says, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret. All right, now you guys want to know what the secret is. Keep listening. He says, of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. All right, now think about that when you're hungry. Can you be content like that? You know, can you be thankful in that situation? He says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And this is Philippians 4.10 through 13. And I think Philippians 4.13 is a verse that a lot of people live by, that they can do all things through Christ, that they can do all things through him who gives them strength. And look at what Paul says leading up to that verse. He's talking about through all these hardships and, and all the things he faced. He was beaten, he was tortured, and, and eventually crucified for his beliefs and he is saying I can do all things I can endure all these things through him who gives me strength that's powerful he says I have fought the good fight I have finished the race I have kept the faith now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day he's talking about the future resurrection he says and not only to me but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And this was in 2 Timothy, one of the last books Paul wrote before he was put to death. And he is, you know, he is speaking knowing, you know, he, it's just spiritually he knows what's going to happen. And he's saying he's fought the good fight and that his reward is coming. Okay, that, that's a powerful message for him to leave us with. And as you look for, you know, God's message for you and, and, and financially speaking where is it is to be content to rejoice always pray continuously give thanks in all circumstances not all circumstances are going to be great but if you have contentment and you have joy and you're rejoicing always and you're praying continually you can give thanks in all circumstances for this is god's will for you in christ jesus thank you and god bless